You can't set and forget a process. It has to be consistently reviewed. It has to consistently be aligned to the changing market dynamics of the actual organisation. Welcome to Process Pioneers, the show that takes a deep dive into the minds of decision makers, key influencers, and process experts who are pioneering the world of everything process. Welcome to the next episode of Process Pioneers. My name is Daniel Rayner. I am the host of Process Pioneers and what a a series this has been so far. I think we are up to around episode 140-ish, approaching uh, episode 150, which we've got some exciting things uh, planned uh, for the big 150. Um, So very exciting. And in this series, we have conversations with all different process practitioners um, from from uh, across uh, many different industries and verticals and in, in various different positions. We talk with uh, people, for experts from the uh, academic realm. We talk with consultants. We talk with people that are working internally at or, uh, within organizations, uh, helping them to improve the organization, um, working on business process management. And so it's... Um, It is a privilege to be able to sit down with these people and glean from them. Uh, If you have been following the podcast for some time and you've gleaned something from it, I would um, appreciate a a review or a rating on whatever uh, uh, podcast channel you're listening to this on, whether that's Spotify, Apple, maybe you're listening to us on YouTube, please subscribe. Um, Otherwise, uh, let's get into today's episode. I have the absolute privilege of sitting down with uh, Madeline Benjamin. Um, Now, Madeline is a former senior uh, manager of process architecture at CBA was with them for a long time and saw a huge transformation there. So lots, lots for us to glean from, from that experience and is moving into uh, a business process architect role at Ampol Australia. Um, so lots of uh, fantastic um, uh, opportunities for, for improvement uh, in, in your future, Madeline. I'm very excited for this conversation. Thanks for joining, um, joining me. Thank you for the invite, Daniel. <laughs> <laughs> so um, maybe what would be interesting uh, for the, the audience is uh, dive into um, a, your, a little bit of your past experiences, including CBA. Uh, tell us how you uh, stumbled across this diverse and broad world of business process management and um, take us on a bit of a journey leading up to where you find yourself today. Sure, no problem. So my life started in actually telecommunications. Um, I had a good 10-year stint there, uh, primarily as a Genesis engineer for contact centres. Um, and funnily enough, there was a bit of light touch in terms of process there, but I didn't know what it was at the time. Um, and then I went into CBA uh, within the Cominshaw department. And at that time that I went in, CBA were starting to introduce uh, the methodology of continuous improvement for the whole bank. Um, And it was then that I started to understand the essence and the importance of process and what it meant to document it. At the time, CBA was talking process mapping, not modelling. and how to derive improvements as a result of that. Um, So I decided to give it a bit of a crack with, especially the team that I was managing in IT, uh, within Cominshore IT, and I wanted to improve a particular process around repetitive work (laughs) that was being done, only to free up one of my most skilled staff Um, because I needed him on other kind of work and he was just doing (laughs) robotics. I think it was very selfish of me, but um, started that process of um, understanding the mapping, the VMVs, the the SWATs, the CIPOX. Um, And it wasn't until probably after I left that area, shortly after I'd received a bit of a message um, from this staff member saying that uh, my nickname's Mads or Maddie, um, by the way. So um, saying, Mads, you wouldn't believe it, but 
we've automated the process and I'm just like, yes. <laughs> so it worked out quite well. But then um, in my role, as I moved into different sections within CBA, um, I got poached by the process architecture team. And at the time it was Dan O'Neill who set that um, team up Um and it was to do process modelling and I'm like, what's process modelling and how is it different from process mapping? Right. And it was just a whole new learning for me in terms of what process modelling is. And I did quite a bit of work within the team. Um, I helped out with uh, work within payments within IBM. Um, we did a whole transformational exercise for the cards department as well. Um, and because they followed the methodology that Dan set up at the time, um, it sought a great improvements within the area. It was then that I was asked to help out with the procurement group of CBA. And I thought, oh, okay, no problem. Um, so I went into there and that was... That, that required a lot of work. <laughs> so I had to understand what was going on. I had to explain modelling, the methodology, what a taxonomy is, what it means, how it's interpreted to modelling. Um, so there was a lot of education that occurred at the time. Um, and it was Karen Sutton at the time um, who was very supportive of, of this. So I was coached again <laughs> into um, procurement to to establish that that speciality within the team for process. Um, so a lot of work was done there, a lot of um, development of VMVs, albeit your your boards or your digital VMVs. So there's a lot of work that was um, done in terms of trying to transform the procurement area that exercise went on for quite for quite a bit and just before i left um it saw to some wonderful things being done within the area um through the support of the great leadership team that is there um so you had the the remodeling of the actual operations um within the area as well as it got merged into another division um word got out in terms of what we do and how we do it and the benefits and we were engaged by the leasing group within that area to help them out as well with what they were doing. Um, so it started to really pick up in terms of all the transformation across the bank as a whole. Um, and at the time when Dan set this uh, team up, uh, he bought in Aris, uh, which was the modelling tool that the bank chose to use at the time, and um, that was that was different as well because it was trying to help people understand, you know, your different symbols and what they interpret and why the tool and how do we use it, and and that was just great. And Matt Common really actually supported that to this day, and he does today as well very he's very big on process and process efficiency as well <laughs> yeah yeah no that's great that's really interesting so you've obviously worked across multiple industries uh does the process approach change depending on the industries is is there a certain nuances depending on the industry you're working in or is it pretty standard across um all, all industries are the the opportunities um, there regardless look the opportunities are there regardless um it, it's a it's not a set and forget and, and that was something that i discovered um as i got deeper into the process world you can't set and forget a process. Um, it has to be consistently reviewed. It has to consistently be aligned to the changing market dynamics of the actual organisation. So um, in order to be able to do that, you've really got to look at the market base and what's happening out there 
um, in terms of being able to adjust the processes accordingly. But in saying that, I, I don't believe from what I've seen that one can actually do that if they have not properly documented how things stand or how things are being operated with within a particular team or a division or an organisation for that matter. In order to have that visual, it helps better align with what changes need to be done. It, it's I see it, and this is something that I used to, a term that I used to use quite a lot in procurement, um, it's the birthing process of everything else. So your technology enhancements, your people movements, your operating models, it actually gives birth to all of that. Mm -hmm. And if not done properly, you're constantly going to be in a reactive kind of a mode. You're not going to be able to operate in an agile manner. I mean, I know organisations are very big right now on, oh, well, they have been for quite some time, your Lean Six Sigma, your Agile. But if you look at the fundamental basis in order to start those methodologies off, it's that of process. Mm -hmm. So that actually helps get all of that goodness and richness happening. Mm -hmm. and, and you've obviously been involved in organisations where there, there is somewhat of an understanding of the, the value of process. They've been driven to adopt this sort of process-centric approach. Um, what would you say are the, bit, the main drivers um, to, to adopt process? Because there are some organisations out there that um, they, they don't do process. They, they don't do any form of process management or modelling or anything like that. Um, so what, what would you say are the key drivers, um, the, the key reasons why an organisation gets to a point where they're like, we need to understand this better? <laughs> <laughs> it's broken. It's not working. <laughs> Nothing is being done on time um, where it, the ball is being dropped. So it's all that kind of thinking, that you, your standard change methodologies that um, where there's a lot of pain <laughs> being felt um, in the way that things are being done. Um, so when you come in and you sort of say, oh, okay, look, let me try and help you because the last thing you want is to say to people, You've really got to get them on board with this journey for them to understand. Um, and the last thing you want when you come in to an area that is just in dire pain <laughs> from what is happening and the way that they're operating is to go in and go, it's your process and, oh, my God, it is just not working. It, it, it's sort <laughs> of like, okay, look, can I, can I just offer some help? Can we sit down? Then just help me understand what's going on. So as they're talking and you start what I'm going to do, what I'm going to say, um, writing in the process hieroglyphics, <laughs> so <laughs> you start doing that, people sort of look and go, oh, what are you doing? I'm like, I'll just explain it. it. It just helps me understand a bit better what it is that you're saying and so that I can repeat to you what it is that you're telling me with what I'm doing and you let me know if it's right or wrong. <laughs> Yes. Go, I say no problem. So that works, I found personally, that works as an engagement mechanism to get that curiosity going in terms of I want to know more. Mm. It, it allows them to be a lot more open to the capability uplift of understanding mm. process better. Um, so that's how I've done things in the past and that's how I've found organisations tend to engage with process, um, well, with everything that I've done, it's always been a help. Yes. <laughs> There's something wrong. We need yes. something fixed here. So, yeah, it's just coming in with the I'm going to try and be your saving grace but I don't know if that would work, but let's give it a go. <laughs> so. Yes, yes, yeah, no, that's great. And um, you, you've obviously experienced like many 
um, significant uh, wins um, by adopting process management. You've already shared a number with a number of them with us, including um, wanting to free up um, a key person's time um, so you could redeploy them on other activities. Yeah. Uh, do you have more more sort of examples that you could share with us um, yeah. uh, in, in others other cases where um, uh, process management was adopted and there was a clear sort of tangible outcome that everyone was like, "Wow, this you know this works," and we need to do more. It. Yeah. Um, so um, I'll use one of the examples in the bank where we were involved with the cards area. Um, and it, there was just a lot of difficulty and a lot of manual work. And people were just getting caught up in the here and now of the manual aspect of how things were being done, um, which was great for us because it helped us at the time map everything out and then when we transform so we okay when we did what we did we process mapped okay um using the visio methodology um but then when we transformed it to the process model it became a lot clearer as to where all the pain points were and that was just like a wow at the time um, and the opportunities that were, oh, let's do this and let's do that and we need this and we need that. And I'm like, well, well, well hang on, hang on. Now we've got to <laughs> prioritise these opportunities so that we we deal with our painfuls. <laughs> then we look at our digitizations, our robotics and, and what have you in terms of technology and then we move on to much fancier stuff in terms of operating models. Um, and there was great support from the senior management there. And, and I found that that is very, very important because other areas, albeit CBA or Telstra, um, if you don't have that support from the senior leaders down, then you're going to be in that consistent pain, the Band-Aid actions. Um, you really need that support and that understanding because that helps motivate the energy that's required for anything else that comes out of modelling from a process. So it's very, very important. Yeah, yeah, great. And um, just on that, so, yeah, get, getting that um, senior leadership support, I think that's uh, a, a huge challenge for a lot of people. Um, yeah. um, when when getting that buy in, um, getting that that the, the resources, getting the budget to invest into it. Um, how do you go about doing that? Um, because I know that there'd be uh, quite a few people listening to this episode that um, they might be facing. They might be in that position right now where yeah. they, they maybe they've been bought in um, to work on a particular project or work in a particular area, and they're needing more buy-in. They're needing more sponsorship, or or or, um, or maybe it's um, you know th there's someone in the organisation and they've recognised you know there are all of these pain points, all of these challenges. We need to adopt this approach. How do I bring the senior leadership along this journey? Yeah. Do you help us? <laughs> um, when going in, be on a thousand percent alert for your quick wins. Because once you, the, the quick wins, what I found is they don't require any costings, they don't require any resources, but the benefits are so visible. They're, they're very visible that it does attract the the attention required from the senior leaders as to how can we upscale this to our overall business objective. So get your quick wins and get them happening. Bring them to life. Mm. Um, show the results. Um, talk about the results. Get your leader to advocate for the results as well. So never dismiss um, using your own leadership team in mm. terms of what you've done, how you've done it, and the benefits that have come out of that. That then sort of inspires senior leaders to say, help me with this, how, do, how can we get this going? But don't talk the technicalities of process when that actually happens. Mm. Keep it simple. Mm. Keep it simple. 
um, because this is where people get lost. Like, I mean, uh, I worked in IT and and every time we had a high severity incident, for example, uh, I was managing the application oper- operations at the time. But when I mm-hmm. get um, these technical geniuses um, who I call Einstein's reincarnated come to me and talk to me, I'd be like, and that means what? <laughs> <laughs> So um, remember that. Just keep the language simple mm. until you build the capability of people understanding the language mm. in which you are speaking that you can then talk fluently in mm. terms of that. Um, so I found that works really, really well, and I found that most of the engagements that I've gotten throughout the years in my career has been as a result of that. Yeah, right. Um, okay. It's been phenomenal. Mm, yeah, definitely. And, and so after you've um, achieved those quick wins and you do start to get a bit of buy-in, um, what, what does a sustainable BPM look like? What, what does BPM, like adopting BPM enterprise-wide, yeah. um, everyone's along this journey. Um, it's so much more than just modelling processes and, and sort of documenting them. That, that, that There's all of these other aspects to it. Um what does sustainable BPM look like? What are the foundations that need to be in place? My advice with that would be the people that you engage with in the organisation are your customers. And as with any customer relationship, to sustain that, there needs to be consistent interaction and consistent communication. And that way then you're able to understand what else is surfacing that you can step in with, that you can help make a difference. Uh, At the end of the day, the way that I view process and anything else that comes out of process, um, albeit your technology enhancements, your operating model changes, It needs to come from a place and a desire to really want to make a difference in people's lives. Mm. It's not the mechanics. It's not the technicality of how you write the language Mm. to bring out that goodness. Um, It's how you keep the relationship with your clients, with your customers Mm. in terms of talking to them. Mm. And I find that tends to help not only strengthen the engagement and the trust, but to keep you consistently engaged and active in helping these people build their processes and drive improvements because that's that's all it is at the end of the day. It's identifying Mm. where the improvements are required because it's all well and good that you can go and implement a new technology for a particular part of the process, but the problem may not be in that area. Mm. It may be either further up or it may be further down. Mm. It may not be in that. So if you don't bring that to light, then people are going to suffer at the end of the day constantly. And it's the end user (laughs) that tends to have to deal with all of this. Yes, so right. For me, the thought process is if I can make a difference in the life of a team of three, <laughs> then I'm happy and I'll continue to do that. <laughs> yes, yeah, definitely, definitely. So so I guess it depends on the, the position in an organisation and the circumstance, but um, where... Uh, um, should 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 the you know the people listening and they're, they're in organisations that are maybe they're on this journey of um, um, documenting their processes? Um, how important is it to establish the process architecture versus diving into that sort of nitty gritty um, lower level detailed process um, on a particular area? Um, yeah. wh- where do you start, and how do you identify which process uh, to begin with? Are you, are you starting with the um, the one that's um, creating the most havoc, like uh, um, craving the most attention, or are you looking at more of it from an end to end point of view? Talk to us about um, those different things. 
Um, I think it's very important for people to understand the concept of a process taxonomy <clears throat> mm -hmm. um, because it's just like your one pager of this is how my area or my business works mm -hmm. and how one part of the process feeds into another and mm -hmm. where there's a depend. It just helps you at a glance understand all of this. Mm. Um, also in as you're doing that, have a very attentive ear to when people go, oh, we do this, this, but um, it is so hard to get that going because I've got to wait for X, Y, note it down. Get mm. that down because that will actually help you understand when you come to map the process as to what areas are actually requiring more attention in the first instance. Mm. So listen to those call outs at, in the process of it's don't be silo focused on just mapping the process. Mm. Um, ensure that when you come to transform a map to a model, and and, and I must actually clarify, clarify this because a lot of people go, what's the difference? Mm. So with a process map, all you're doing is putting in a diagram, um, how things are done, mm. how it's done. Mm -hmm. This is how it's done. With a model, on the other hand, though, it's not only how it's done, it's by what mechanism is it done. Mm. And, and the two are very different. Mm. So when you're looking at a model, you can see at a glance how many manual processes do you actually have? Mm, mm. And is there an opportunity at that point to actually automate? Right. Make sure your analysis is extremely thorough by way of your data collection, albeit your quantitative or your qualitative data, in order to be able to overlay that on, on top of the model. Because if you're going to substantiate an improvement for a, approval, especially where money is involved, <laughs> you need to look at, you need to be able to tell the story of this is what's happening now and this mm. is actually how much it's costing you. Mm, mm. Moving to this or to the future state, this is what you will be paying, but these are the cost savings you'll be getting per annum in return. Mm. So being able to fundamentally bring that out will actually help quite a lot in terms of people understanding the difference of process mapping, process modelling and the importance. Mm. In saying that, though, it just doesn't stop at the mapping or the modelling aspect of a process. It is right. so much more than that, so mm. much more, because then you have to have your documentation mm. in terms of how, how is that supported how do I, I can't put a model in front of an end user and go, and this is your standard operating procedure, my friend, just follow that. I can't do that. Right. <laughs> um, the end user has not been trained on the science of this. Right. <laughs> um, so you just can't do that. So in order yes. to build a standard operating model, you've got to go back to your process mapping and <laughs> simplify the map in order to be able to write the documentation. So the two methodologies, if used correctly, can bring out so much goodness and so much richness in organisations and teams and end users as well in understanding mm. their process. And you tend to find that over time when you're consistently following up and seeing how they're going and understanding what further challenges are coming through, they tend to pick up that skill mm, mm. themselves and they do it as part of their DNA, which is just a phenomenal transformation within teams, within an organisation. Mm. So the improvement element of their process is at the forefront of anybody's mind. Yes, yeah, yeah, right. And I think that it's um, 
it really goes to show that when you foster and create that culture of continuous improvement and 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 your people are aware that uh, my suggestions are valued i can bring my thoughts to the table cuz you know we, we can leverage the um improvement ideas of those that are actually doing the work and actually yes. um it, it's their tasks that they're carrying out so as you said as soon as you as soon, as soon as someone flags something jot that that down, write that down. That's something that's obviously an identified pain there, or identified pain potentially. Um, they've got some solutions or some ideas and how you how they can improve that. Um, and I think that's ultimately it's going to um, only um, make uh, help that enterprise wide adoption continue to be fostered um, when you've got people that are. Um, owning, taking responsibility for their processes, identifying improvements, and and then um, providing suggestions and improvements and solutions um, to those as well. Yeah, 100%. Mm, That's great. And um, so now looking towards um, the future of uh, business process management, the trends that you're noticing, what 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 the next two, three, five years look like. Obviously, the the last three years with COVID and everything, it's it's certainly um, created quite a turbulent landscape where biz, uh, processes have been put in the spotlight uh, because a lot of processes have had to adapt and change and and improve and um, in some cases die. Um, what, what what do you notice? What are you noticing um, at the moment? And what do you think the next two, three, five years look like for for process management? Yeah, look, um, COVID really, really shook shook the fort by way of agile processes, I think, in all organisations. The mere fact that um, organisations actually had to pivot within a period of 48 hours, (laughs) so... um, for all everyone to work remotely or for emergency actions to be undertaken, it, it really, it really shook the fort in terms of how agile are we? Mm. How agile is any organization? And look, for my career, I, I thank COVID for that <laughs> because um, it it brought to light the importance of Mm. understanding, and I'm not going to call it the methodology, but the science Mm. of process. Mm. Because in essence, um, it really, that's what it is. It's it's the engineering aspect of being Mm. able to really engineer a process that is suitable for an organisation to be able to easily pivot. And if not, how can you adjust it keeping in mind not to put the organisation in any form of risk, Mm. any kind of legal risk. Um, So there's a lot of factors that need to be considered as a Mm. result of that. Mm. Um, It's made the word process be a lot more used in people's mouths across industries, which is fantastic. Mm. Um, And I found... I was actually really impressed um, by Ample when when I when I saw this position. Um, so CBA yes did have this, and Dan Dan O'Neill did kick this off by establishing a specific process office. Um, but there was still a lot of uptake that needed to be undertaken with that. Mm. Um, what I was really impressed when I um, applied for the position at Ampol was the mere fact that they have set up a a division <laughs> specifically for that, and that was quite impressive. Right. Uh, I think that was quite sophisticated and impressive. Yes, um, because it clearly is a point of focus and a priority that. Mm. That is the starting point for anything to move forward. Yes, yeah. Even to help respond to the market need of what is actually needed. Yes. Um, so I I feel probably the next two to five years, we'll probably see more and more organisations having these 
setups within them and requiring that skill. Mm. Um, more so for those that are umming and ahhing about um, getting their BPM certi- certification, go do it because <laughs> um, the more that people understand the element of process modelling, the greater desire I believe it's, it's going to have in many industries. Yeah, yeah, no, that's great, and that's really exciting. I think um, give it another six, twelve months, and 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 we'll probably have another episode. We'll need to do it do together to um, <laughs> check in on the progress and how everything at Ampol has gone. But but Maddie, I just want to thank you for sitting down with me today. I've yeah. been taking a lot of notes myself, and I'm sure that uh, that the audience has been gleaning a lot from this conversation as well. Um, it's you know it's quite um, unique to get someone um, that that has been cross industries. Um, uh, telco, uh, financial services, now moving into to Ampol. Um, it's, you know, there's a, a lot that you you would have picked up from all those different experiences. And it's, you know, it's uh, very helpful for us to be able to glean from uh, someone like yourself with that um, expertise. So I just want to thank you um, for sitting down with me today. It's been an, an absolute pleasure. Thank you so much, Daniel. I appreciate the reach out and really enjoyed speaking with you. 